Christmas. Does anyone get to this time of the year and they're just hanging out for Christmas? No? You're not like that? Boy, I am. And I won't be seeing any of you at Christmas, okay? That's the plan. Um, I'm going to go to my mum's. She lives down in Tumut and uh, down near the Snowy Mountains there and there's a the Tumut River, which is filled with platypus and more importantly, big trout, uh, is about 800 metres from my mum's house. And every afternoon, the trout start to rise on that river and feed off insects on the surface. And I stand there with a fly rod and try to catch them. Uh, I look forward to those small things in life that are really important to give us energy. So we can continue to serve, and that gives me a bit of energy. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts today. We call it Acts of the Apostles. It should be Acts of the Holy Spirit. I just love the book of Acts, and I love Acts, the sixth chapter. And that's where we are this morning, Acts chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 1. And before we do any of that, we're going to have a prayer. Let's just bow our heads together. Father, as we pause in your presence, we're opening this old book. The book in which the Spirit inspired. It's a book that is unlike any other. And Father, we claim the promise today that it never returns unto you void. And Father, we ask that you would take its words and you would speak to your church today and you would change us and make us what you want us to be. As That's our prayer and we ask it and we claim it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Now... In those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Uh, Acts chapter 6 becomes a pivotal piece of history in the Christian church because it's the first time in the book of Acts we discover that churches fight amongst themselves. Church members do. Is that true? Churches have this innate ability to fight over the dumbest things. Food is a worthy thing to fight over. And at the church luncheon today, where is it, Mamong Point or somewhere? Marmong, Marmong Point, there'll be no fighting over food, we hope. But there was a fight in the early church in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. It says there was a cultural difference. The Hellenists who speak Greek with the Hebrews that have grown up, they're all Jews, by the way. They all go to the synagogue, but some grew up in the diaspora. They grew up speaking Greek and were thoroughly Hellenized in their culture. The others were from Jerusalem their whole life, and they probably spoke Aramaic slash Hebrew in worship. And they had a cultural crossover here, and they noticed that for some reason, the guys distributing the food were neglecting those that were from a Greek heritage. They started to murmur and complain until it bubbled to the surface and it spilled over in the church. John Stott, in his wonderful commentary on the book of Acts, says this is the third satanic attack on the church. The third attack, and it's a pretty good attack. The first one happens in Acts chapter 5 and verse 1. And the first attack was one of corruption. Ananias and Sapphira 
were pretending they were something they weren't, giving up all the money, but in reality they were keeping it back for themselves. And it was corrupting the church and making it a facade, making it superficial, and it would have robbed the church of the Spirit's witness in people's life. He doesn't bear witness to falsehood. He bears witness to the truth. And so that attack of corruption was seen off There was a funeral straight after the corruption. And the people that were corrupt dropped dead and were buried. I would have loved to have seen the tithe receipts for that next week's service. Duly. (laughs) Every treasurer's dream. The second attack in Acts chapter 5 is one of persecution. Unfamiliar for most of us. Persecution where you are physically, forcibly imprisoned and attacked because of your commitment and faith in Jesus Christ. The problem with persecution and why it's so ineffective for the devil is it actually makes the church better, not worse. It has a purifying effect on the church. And anyone that gets involved in the church when it's going to come at great personal cost, they do so because they really believe. They're not there because mum said I should go or dad used to come here or grandpa. They make a choice in their heart and they say, yeah, I don't care if it's going to cost me my life. I'm going to live for Jesus. So that second attack, it ultimately had the opposite impact because it caused the church to pray. (laughs) And whenever the church prays, it is given power and is given the strength of God and the presence of God and the church became better because of the persecution. So in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, we see a new line of attack and the attack was not one of fighting, That's kind of the surface issue. The real attack upon the church was not the fact that churches have problems amongst themselves. Let me say for all of you to hear, there will never come a time where the church is not going to have some sort of problem going on in the church. If you're waiting to find the perfect church, you will never find it. And if you do, please don't join it because you're going to wreck it. Just keep well away from it. You will become the problem. So what was the attack? The attack wasn't the fact they were fighting. In verse 2 it says, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The attack, this satanic attack upon this amazing movement in history was an attack of distraction. The plan was to get the church doing things it was not called to do. Well, hang on. Specifically, people within that church who had been gifted and called by God doing things that they were not supposed to do. We need to unpackage this a little because there is a place for serving tables and there is a place for ministering the Word of God. By the way, in God's eyes, who is more important? Those that Minister the Word of God or those that serve tables? Trick question. Who is most important? They're equal, aren't they? In fact, they are both on par with God. The issue was not the fact how you served. The issue is that you were serving the way God had called you to serve. And the Bible says there in Acts chapter 2, the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples. And I I have to stop there because I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this. 
These are apostles of Jesus Christ that live with him for three, three and a half years. If anyone should be able to jump up and sort this out, these guys should be able to do it. But you notice what the 12 do? The 12 summon the rest of the church together because in God's church, whether you are the conference president or the local member, you are one vote. You are one vote. Did you hear what I said? There are no popes in the Adventist church. There's a couple of would-be's. Pretenders. No names. Notice that the authority of the church is in the body of believers. Praise God it's in the body of believers and not in some important apostles. Peter got rebuked to his face by the Apostle Paul. And so he should have. And Peter was one vote and so was Paul. And every member in there was an equal voice. That's the way God wants the church to be. He doesn't want any popes. Jesus is our Pope. What a great Pope he is. I get really concerned when I see churches, Bob, I can say this because this has nothing to do with you. I get really concerned when I see churches that become victims of their pastor. I'm a pastor. Bob, you're a pastor. You know, we know what we're talking about here. I get really disturbed when I see this weakness that's come upon the Adventist church where they're just like sheep that they bar on cue. Ma, ma. Uh, we are all a priesthood of believers. God has invested in that whole body, all the sheep together, the authority. The only one that would act contrary to that are wolves. And I love, I love the fact that I am held accountable by the body of believers. Not by the president up the hill or the president up the hill from there. I'm held accountable by the members of the church. And that's how a local church should be. The board meeting tells the pastor what to do. Sometimes the pastor tells the board meeting what to do. <laughs> because he has to tell them the voice of God. But in the end, it is the whole body of believers that will decide together. That's when a church is strong. Never feel that you are a victim and you don't have a voice. If you don't have a voice, you're not going to be involved and it's not going to matter. I want every member to view themselves as a minister. Different gifts, different gifts, different responsibilities, but we all, we all kneel at a cross on a hill called Calvary and at that cross, we are all equal. Every one of us. There's a real tendency in the modern world to have the important people make the decisions, not in the early church. Early church, the body of believers made the decision. And we've clung on to that as a denomination. May we cling on to it. The solution to the problem is given in verse 3. There's always a solution. Acts chapter 6 in verse 3, it says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men. Seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. I want you to notice with me today the solution that the early church had. It was proposed by the 12, agreed to by the church, that they were to seek out seven men 
they were characteristics that I think are very important for us to ponder. What were the characteristics that the early church was looking for in these seven men? Number one, they were of good what? Report or reputation. Was that reputation out in the world or in the church or both? It was both, wasn't it? If you want to know what someone is like, look at what they have been in the past. That's not always true, is it? Paul, the murderer of Christians, becomes Paul, the saver of sinners. So there is a change, but a good way to tell whether someone can be trusted with an important office is to have a look at what they have been in the past and see what is their reputation to choose people in leadership in the church on the basis of their behavior and how others have observed that. Novel idea, isn't it? Novel idea. And full of the Holy Spirit. I wonder, I wonder what the church might be like today if that was the criteria for all of our leaders. That they would not only have good reputation, but their connection with God was the highest priority of their life, their devotional life, their prayer life. Their study and devotion of the Scriptures was the thing that was central to who they were. That's how you tell someone filled with the Holy Spirit. That means their connection with heaven was their highest, highest priority. Oh, hang on. They run this business. They've got this doctorate. They've got these skills. They did this here. They did that there. That's what qualifies them. Not in the early church. In the early church, their devotion to God. Their devotion to God became the highest priority for their election to an office. I wonder. I wonder what the church would look like today if that became the number one criteria for people's selection. I know how that would change how it's all led. I apply that to myself first of all. Verse 4, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I want you to notice here what the apostles saw their calling in life. Their calling in life, they were established by Jesus. Something very unique happens in Acts chapter 6. Up until this point, you know how they elected someone? How they went about doing it? They did something that they call casting lots. Has anyone ever cast lots? Oh, I've never cast lots. I, I flip the coin, draw straws. I don't know, they threw these different length sticks on the ground and whoever got the most won. Uh, they, when, when Judas was uh, taken out and they had to replace him, Matthias replaces him after they cast lots and they replaced him to that office. That was the last time they ever did that in the Bible. They gave up casting lots and they start to do, they appoint people here on the basis of reputation and connection with heaven. Filled with faith. They themselves were so keen to have these deacons appointed because the distraction that was coming to their life is they were going to get pulled off doing the most important thing that they had been called to. They had not been called by God to serve tables, they had been called by God to minister His word. And I want to tell you guys, can I just, uh, just put a pause on things here? I, <laughs> you know, 
I travel around to different churches in our conference and I am staggered. I am staggered at how some churches, of course, I'm never, I'm, not, none of this applies to Charlestown. Not Charlestown, okay? Can everyone say, this is not Charlestown? Let me hear you. This is not Charlestown. I'm staggered at how churches treat their pastors. One church rang up to complain because their pastor had not changed the toilet paper in, the lo- in their toilet at the church. Have mercy on my soul. The most disturbing thing to me is that that's what he normally did. <laughs> Serve tables. Have mercy. Pastor is a, is a unique, uh, an elder. The only gift an elder had to have, the only ability they had to have is they had to have the ability to teach the Word of God. They, everything else, they were chosen the Bible according to their character, according to whether they had, how many wives they had, you know, whether they were a drunkard, all those sort of things. It was all character. But then there was one skill, they had to be able to teach the Word of God because that is the office to which they are called. And I'll have pastors running around doing community gardens, changing toilet paper, wiping people's noses. And I'll say, how many Bible studies you got, brother? Bible studies? Who's got time for Bible studies? Now, we should all share the Scripture with anyone we can, but there are certain people who've been gifted by God to teach it. And you know what they should do? Teach it. And if it's your gift, I'm sorry. If it's your calling, be faithful to your calling. There's no, nothing wrong with serving tables. Man, I am glad that when I go to the bathroom at a church that someone put some toilet paper in there. Praise the Lord. But you know what? We have all been gifted and called by God in unique and certain ways and the church is at its best when we are not distracted from what God has called us to do. And I personally struggle with my job because I'm not sure that that is my gifting. This is what I love to do. By the way, not to Adventists. My favorite thing in all the world is to teach this to lost people who've never heard it before. I think it's the greatest work in the world to teach the Word of God to a new person that's never studied it before. It is such a buzz, and I think I'm under the punishment of heaven doing the job that I'm doing. Because I really just want to go and do that one. Not much longer. That's what I keep telling myself, at least. I shouldn't say that. God's going to curse me with it for 20 years. We're going to give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. I wonder if our pastoral team in North New South Wales was like that, what would happen? I mean, the guys that are trained theologians, that are equipped and called by God to do it, that we actually let them do that. I wonder what would happen. Maybe we'll get to find out. It's fascinating to me that the early Adventists never appointed pastors to churches. How it would work is they would team up, Bob and I, and we would have a tent, Bob. And I don't know, maybe a horse or a wagon, I'm not sure. Maybe just a horse. Bob would have the horse and I'd be walking. And we'd go to a town somewhere and we would pitch that tent. We'd pitch that tent together and we'd set up a stage down one end. And you know what we would do in that tent? We would give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word, and we would raise up a church in that town. You know what the members were doing? They were looking after themselves. We did not appoint pastors to churches until after the death of Ellen White in 1915. Never happened. She railed against such practices. It happened then in the 1920s and... and 
we kind of made this transition where you still had all these evangelists running around with tents and big beasts and slides. And now we've got to the place where you can hardly find one of those. Find me one of those. Instead, we've got all these churches that demand, they want this in a pastor, they want that in a pastor. Can you give us another one and another one and some Bible workers as well? Because we can't get it done. All I'm saying, folks, is we've drifted a little bit off the mark where we once were. And I think we best be careful that we are doing the very thing that God has called us to do. In verse 5, and this saying pleased the whole multitude. Did you see that? There's the church. It had to have their approval. If it didn't have their approval, I'm just looking to see what time they've given me to preach here. I've still got a little bit of time, okay. It got the whole multitude, it pleased the whole multitude. They took it to the body of believers and that one vote principle. Democracy works within the Christian psyche. They, 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 the Americans got this great idea, and I apologize to any Americans. I love America. The Americans got this great idea that they would have a war and enforce democracy in the Middle East. My friends, you can't legislate some stuff. It comes out of your understanding of who you are and your whole worldview. Christianity and democracy are wonderful bedfellows. That's how the church functioned. It's a Greek concept, democracy. But Christianity just was just so much in line with that that they thought that was a good idea. And it still functions in the church today. A lot of countries in the world don't have it. It says, They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. Just pause for a moment there. What had they just chosen Stephen to do? Let's think back in the story. There's fights between all these widows. We need some people to do, it says, the business. They were to serve what? Tables. The view of the early church is they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, to serve the table. Answer me this, my friends. Did Stephen serve tables? He dies as the first Christian martyr after preaching the most amazing evangelistic sermon, the courage of this man, what he did that day is unbelievable. And you, you find that out by just going over a few more chapters. Uh, when you get over to chapter, uh, chapter 7 and 8, Stephen's made a martyr by the end of the next chapter, by the end of chapter 7. Stephen who the church's idea is that he would be a fantastic deacon, it turns out that he becomes the most amazing evangelist that up until this point the early church had seen. God's dreams for the church are far larger than what we have for it. I'm loving your building next door. Anyone else excited about getting in there? It's... Um, it's really exciting to decommission the old building and go into the new one. You, you're going to have a decommissioning sort of thing go on. Have you already done that? Been there, done that. Oh, well, well, man, I can really relax now. It's decommissioned. <laughs> we, we, we send a ship out to have a new purpose now and, and, and we decommission it and we, we set sail the... The HMAS, or, or I, I went on an aircraft carrier, I think it was called the Ronald Reagan that we went on in San Diego. The new aircraft carrier sitting out there in the bay, about to be commissioned. 
with all these fighter planes and everything launching off it. Your dreams for that building are not a quarter of what God's dreams are for what will happen there. Our dreams are so small compared to what God's dreams and visions are for His work and what would happen. And I put before you Stephen as an example. And if Stephen's not enough, this man was such a preacher that when he finished his sermon, the congregation murdered him. Think about that. The congregation, they were unbelievers. Believers would never want to kill the preacher much. The unbelievers that heard the message, the Bible says that they were cut to their heart. You know, it says in Acts chapter 2, they were cut to their heart. And the same response on the day of Pentecost happens at the end of his sermon. They were cut to their heart, not in repentance, but in violence against the messenger because they couldn't accept the truth that he shared. And he has this amazing vision and he dies. The first Christian martyr dies praying which says a lot about the power of the early church. And he dies on his knees and he is speaking directly to Jesus. I always teach people in Bible study how to pray. You pray to the Father in Jesus' name. You talk to God the Father and all that. Stephen ignores that. Stephen speaks directly to his Savior as he dies there. The first Christian martyr appointed to serve tables by the church, but appointed by God for a work far above what the church could envision and imagine. The next name in the seven deacons is Philip. Philip, guess what he becomes? He's another one of these evangelists. It amazes me that we are raising up so few evangelists today. It's a result of the Spirit's work to raise up such men and women. And the second one in the list who is supposed to serve tables, in fact, spreads the gospel to new areas and becomes, he, he actually does, if you read the book of Acts carefully, he does a Star Trek, beam me up Scotty and get somehow moved, transported by the Spirit from one place to another place. Amazing. I don't read the other names in Acts chapter 6 because I struggle to pronounce them. It's okay not to be able to pronounce some Bible names in my world. My grandfather set the example that he just said wheelbarrow when he saw a word he couldn't say. In verse 6, it says, Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed and laid hands on them, there it is again. We talked about this in Sabbath school time. We talked about ordination. I want you to notice that as soon as they had appointed these guys, before they'd set them forth, the Bible says that they laid hands on them in prayer. That's another way to say they ordained them to the office of deacon. Note with me. They pray laying hands on them. Guess what happens next? They get up and get on with it. There's no hoo-ha. Enough with all the hoo-ha. They have a prayer and dedicate these people to God in prayer and ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit in an abundant way in their life, in their ministry, and then they just get up and get on with it. And verse 7 I love verse 7 of Acts chapter 6. This is my last verse today because the clock is saying so and it was going to be anyway. It says, Then the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. I want you to notice the spiritual law of Acts 6 and verse 7. It is a spiritual law. It works as effectively today as it did in the early church. As the word of God is spread, the number of disciples multiplies. I want you to notice that. 
The reason the devil wanted to distract the apostles and get them off the Bible, because if we stopped sharing the Bible, this life-saving message of Jesus and his redemption, if we stop sharing that, the church will stop growing. And I learned very early in my ministry as a young pastor, the number of Bible studies I conducted in a week had a direct proportion to the number of people that became disciples of Jesus. You can pretend that that's not true. I'm here today to tell you it is the absolute truth. It is like the law of gravity. It works every time. The number of Bible studies given relates directly to the number of disciples that are made for Jesus. It's His method. It's His Word. That's why the church must be careful not to drift off the mark to what it's been called to do, to remember that we are here to bear witness to Jesus' message, to share His Word, his word has power. I just watched the testimony of this uh, brother from the Muslim faith. He, he would meet Christians. He was raised a Muslim. He would meet Christians and he would challenge them about their faith. And they would just say, oh, oh I don't want to fight about that. They couldn't defend their faith to him. And he thought Christians were dummies. They couldn't even explain the Bible to him. And then one day in university, he met a Christian who knew his Bible. And guess what the Bible-believing Christian would say when he was challenged? He'd give him a verse and he'd challenge him and challenge him. And this young Muslim man was so challenged by what he got shared with, he started to read it. I want to tell you, this is a dangerous book to read. Read it every day. Dangerous stuff. As he read it and read it, he realized the, the Quran, it never had one verse in it that could give him comfort. Yet the Bible was filled with comfort. And he realized that this book was something special. And today he's an amazing evangelist reaching out to his brothers and sisters in Islam with the message of Scripture. I don't care what method you use in evangelism, there's one thing I'll guarantee you. At some point, people have to get to know the author of the book. And it is always in proportion to how this book is shared, preached, taught, whatever we do, to the number of disciples that are made. I pray that you won't be just a hearer of the word today, but a doer of the word, that when you wake up tomorrow morning, it's Sunday tomorrow, isn't it? All day. When you wake up tomorrow morning, I love Sunday because I get, it's my day. This is God's day today, tomorrow's my day. I have to go to Melbourne, but apart from that. I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you on your day, Tomorrow, when you get up, can I encourage you just to read a chapter of this book? If you want to read more, that's cool too, but just a chapter. It's a dangerous book. It messes you up. It changes you. And if you can get others to read it, chances are you're giving them every chance that they too can become a disciple of Jesus Christ. May God bless you in that. And my challenge to you today as you wake up tomorrow, read the book, the dangerous book that we call the Bible. That's my prayer. Let's sing out. Are we singing one last song? Great, because I love your singing. You guys have the best worship, I shouldn't say in Newcastle, should I? It's actually much wider than that, that you have, you know, the greatest tragedy for me about this church is there's not more people in here to enjoy what you have here every single week. What a wonderful thing if we could fill this place with more and more people, that they too can experience what you experience here every week. Thank you, Justin.
This is our story, this is our song. Let's praise our Saviour all the day long. Please stand. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praise Him, my Savior. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Tickets are available for Perch just inside the main foyer. Go and see the ladies there. On off. Speak to our hearts today and help us not to be distracted, but to be clear on what you have called us to do and that we would do it with all our might. And Father, we ask too that the Bible might be a big part of who we are. That we too, like, like Stephen, like Philip, characterized as people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that our relationship with you would be the most important priority of our life. Father, please save us and change us with this. Bless this church with their plans and their visions.